Good morning, Waters Church. So blessed you could join us. Beautiful weather, huh? Yeah, yeah, I heard a yeehaw. That was awesome. All right, well, let's stand together as we join in worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We'll live for you Oh, we live for you
place my hope on the rock Our voice this morning, let's sing holy. And we sing holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open your eyes in wonder. Show me who you are. Fill me with your heart. Your presence meet us there When the pain seems overwhelming We hold on to you When the streets are torn by chaos We will be your kids and
doesn't necessarily need another song what it needs is your heart to be open to do the work that God is calling you to do so I want to sing this chorus one more time the world needs Jesus knowing that it can't just stay a song that's why churches die because they don't see outside of themselves and they don't see outside the walls Doug talks about it so often we need to keep our eyes outside of these walls to the people that need it Sing this one more time, we know. I know our world needs Jesus. Our world needs freedom. We must not see the hurt again. Our God, we make that our prayer this morning, Lord God, that you would start with us. God, we know that it starts with us, with the healing in our hearts, Lord God, with accepting your truth and your freedom in our lives, Lord God, so that we can live it out for the world to see, God, for our worlds, for our families, for our neighborhoods, for our communities. Lord, we're thankful that you come in and you do a work in our hearts, Lord God, that is meant to be a light for the whole world to see. And so, Father, I pray in each heart god would you soften us to what you want to do would you speak to our hearts today lord would you do the work in us that only you can come in and god fix broken things and you can heal and restore broken situations and and things that we're walking through lord and so we give those things to you in this moment lord trusting and knowing that they're in safe hands god and that you like to come in and restore and bring freedom and bring hope in the middle of our circumstances and so god we trust in you today we put our hope in you today lord we want to lift up our teams here and we we love to lift up pastor doug and peggy our lead pastors and and their family as they're celebrating their their second nat graduating from high school today we just uh thank you for him and for this family and we just pray your blessing on them god as they lead the charge here and in vision and in passion and in heart for this church and this community, God, and for people to know Jesus ultimately. We just pray blessing on them, that you would use them in a mighty way. You'd encourage them. You'd bless their family time as they're celebrating that today. And so we just thank you so much for them, God. And then we lift up our missionaries and we pray for Jean Johnson, Lord, as she's training nationals in other countries, God, to work in the midst of their situations and their circumstances and to help empower them to do the ministry that you've called them to do. God, we just pray blessing on her today, the missionaries that we get to support. God, I pray that you'd help us to think of them often and pray for them often and lift them up. God, is there on the front lines doing things that that we could only dream of at times? Or God, we know you've called them to it. And so we pray that you would just give her strength and, and the missionaries that we think of weekly. Lord God, just use them in a mighty way in the areas you've called them. And then God, locally, we lift up Relevant Life Church, and we just thank you for Pastor Bruce and for his team, God, and we thank you for other churches in this community that are pointing people to you, and so we pray that you would bless them this morning as they meet, God, you would you would expand their territory, God, you would use them in a mighty way to point people to you here and around this area, Lord, and so we just, we thank you for the churches that are doing that in this community, God, and we thank you that we get to partner with them and help us to just continue to remember to lift those people up and speak unity and speak life um, over those churches and those pastors and those teams. God, we're so grateful for them. And this morning, would you meet with us? God, would you have your way in our hearts and our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can actually stay standing. We have a baby dedication coming 
Ashley and Tim are coming with little Elsie, and we're going to be dedicating her to the Lord. And, and this is, uh, we do dedications here at the Waters, and, and this is, oh, hi, sweetie. She's, she's hard not to be distracted by. She's so cute. Uh, but here's why we do dedications. It, Jesus himself was dedicated in Luke, and on the eighth day, it says, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angels had given him before he was conceived. When the time of purification, according to law, Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary brought him to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. And so we do dedications for three main reasons here. We, we just, first of all, want to give thanks to God for these children. And we're just so grateful for life and, and um, for this family being blessed by this little sweet girl. And then secondly, promise it's a promise as parents and a church family and the family that's here um, smiling and gathered, um, just celebrating this, is that we'd We'd help provide guidance and help um, point her to Jesus and that when she's old enough to make that decision herself, that she would choose to love and serve Jesus with her whole heart and that she would be modeled that love by us as a church family and by uh, her parents and her family around her and that she would come into personal relationship with him. And then thirdly, we love to pray blessings on kiddos here and we'd just love to take a special moment and pray for them. And so I'm going to get to hold her in a second and then we're going to pray for her. So. Would you guys join us as we pray for little Elsie? God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for Tim and Ashley and, and just um, this gift of life that you've blessed them with. Lord, and we thank you for this little girl. God, that you love her, that you knew her before she was born, God, and that you have great plans for her. And so we just pray your blessing on her, Lord God. We pray that she would be raised in a way, God, that she would know you and she would know your love in such a real and tangible way. God, that you would keep her heart soft to the things of you that as she grows up, she would choose to love and to serve you, God, and to run after everything that you have for her. And so we pray just your hand of protection and safety, God, but we just pray more than anything that she would know your love in a real way. And so we just thank you for this family. We thank you for this little life. And so today we dedicate little Elsie Rose Binsfield to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What do you think? <laughs> She's just stone cold. Yeah, she's awesome. Would you guys give this family a hand? <laughs> All right. If you're in fifth through seventh grade, we have a special service for you. You can head out those back doors with our youth pastors. Otherwise, uh, take a quick second, say hello to somebody, meet somebody new. Welcome them to church this morning. Well, welcome to the waters this morning. We're glad to have you guys here with us. My name is Rachel, one of the pastors here. And I just want to say, if this is your first time, uh, you can grab the Connect card that's in the seat pocket in front of you. You can fill that out and bring it to our coffee shop. Or if you're a regular attendee, fill it out and drop it in our offering. We'd love uh, to know you're here with us. And so if there's anything we can pray with you about um, or get you involved in, we'd love to do that. So if this is your first time, you get free coffee back at the coffee shop as well. So um, we'd love to give you and your family some free drinks just to say thanks for coming and checking us out. Uh, we're glad to have you guys here with us. I have a few things I want to tell you about. There's a little card that you should have sat on or near um, around you that says the meeting on it. Next Sunday night at 5 p.m., we have a man night that you, if you're a gentleman in this place, 15 plus, you do not want to miss. We will be grilling and smoking um, 2,000 pounds of meat. So all different kinds. I think there's 500 pounds of rib or 500 pounds of ribeye. Um, and there's tons of, tons of different kinds of meat. So um, this is going to be an exciting event. And honestly, uh, the whole reason we do everything we do behind everything we do is um, to love God, love people, and love life. And this is an incredible way for us to do all of that while eating meat. So um, we would love for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your brothers, your um, co-workers, whatever it is, 
uh, grab this card. And also we have stacks available. You'll see them all over the church. So if you're like, hey, I'm just going to hand this out to a bunch of guys I see this week, uh, do that. We would love for them to join us. It's going to be fun. There's going to be a concert. There's going to be uh, yard games and manly things. I don't even know um, about. They'll probably start chainsaws and car show and stuff like that. So uh, we would love to have you join us for that. And also if you're willing to help, uh, maybe you missed it when we were, um, we were going to do it a couple weeks ago, but the weather was bad. So uh, maybe now you're like, my schedule's open and I can help. You can write that on your Connect card and we'd love to get in touch with you this week and have you help us for this huge event that we're going to have that we're super excited for. And also, uh, the second thing I want to just encourage you on is we have uh, camps that happen throughout the summer. We have a kids camp that they're going to be leaving for uh, next week. And then we also have some junior and senior teen camps. The details are behind me, but honestly, this is an incredible week for your students uh, in junior and senior high, and they can still sign up right now, and the early bird price ends tomorrow, I think, for junior high. So there's more information available on our app, or you can talk to anybody at the info booth or the kiosk and get more information, but we would love for your kiddos to get signed up and go to that, because honestly, it's the best week of their summer. Um, I grew up going to it my whole entire life and have like had the most incredible moments with God and with friends and, and pastors and counselors uh, there myself. And so we love that place. And so we'd encourage you to send your kiddos um, this summer if you're interested. So as the ushers are coming forward, we're going to take this morning's offering. And I just want to also let you know we have the Sartell Parade coming up on Saturday. Um, at 930, we're going to meet. If you want to join us, we love to just flood Sartell with the waters. And so we're going to walk through in a float. We're going to have the band behind us. And um, we'd love for you to join us. We give you a free t-shirt. You meet at the um, city hall, not city hall, police department at 930. And we will get you in our float. And we're going to walk down and just have an incredible time um, going through the Sartell parade and joining our community for something fun. So join us for that this weekend. Um, we could not do these things without you guys partnering with us and without you guys being there. It would be a really boring float if it was just a truck driving through. So we love having people join us. We love having you guys be a part of all of this stuff. So let's pray for the offering this morning. God, I thank you that we get to be a part of so much more than, than just what's happening in our own lives. But God, as we join together, we get to be a part of what you're doing in this kingdom here in Sartell, God, and of people coming to know you and be pointed to you. And so we pray as we give this morning and as we just step out in obedience um, and sacrifice to you, Lord, you would bless it and you would use it to reach people here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Man, that was a good sermon. I just can't wait to live that out in everyday life. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Man, Doug knows the world is round, right? And how am I supposed to get to Judea anyways? I'm in some hell. Yeah, that verse isn't for me. Acts 1.8 And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the answer they were. Which means you'll be a witness here in Sartell, in Sauk Rapids, in St. Cloud, in Minnesota, and then to the ends of the world. So get off your bum, let's go witness. How do they even read this thing? <laughs> Japan? I'm telling you, Ben is way smarter than we're making him look in these videos. So, just say it. Uh, pretty fun. So, you heard it. Get off your bum and go reach the world. That's, uh, so let's just pray and we'll go home, huh? So, that's the message for this morning. No, I'm teasing. Hey, we are um, uh, in our series, uh, The Gong Show, and, uh, and uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about kingdom builders. Uh, and missions and uh, and kind of that verse that uh, that Safa read there and so we're in our final weeks of this series it's been a, an amazing series um, and uh, I would encourage you, if you've missed any of the weeks um, 
Uh, you can check them out online at thewaterschurch.net. You can listen to them. But basically, it's a series uh, that we've been doing that's based out of uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, 13, and 14. And uh, it's scripture that talks about the Holy Spirit and, uh, and his gifts for us. And, uh, and I have to be honest, sometimes the Holy Spirit freaks people out, like the, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're like, yeah, I'm good with the first two, but this third one is kind of making me weird, you know? And, uh, and so it's been cool to just kind of dig in and to, and to see um, God, the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and his role. And, and so we've been digging into that. Um, and this scripture specifically is, a, is an explanation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it gives us instruction on how we're supposed to use them. And uh, it's a description of how the Holy Spirit should play out in our everyday lives. And so uh, the Holy Spirit enables us to love the world outside these walls. And that's something if you're around, and, and we'll talk about it again this morning, but you hear us say that we have to keep our eyes focused outside of these walls, and the Holy Spirit is there to help us. And so uh, he enables us to reach people around us. So this scripture and this series has really been encouragement and instruction on, uh, on how God can move through us. And so it all kind of boils down. The pinnacle verse is in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 1 through 3. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a, claim, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And he goes on in the verse, to the, the famous verse the, in this love chapter that says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. And why, why does he go into this detail? Why does the author here, why, what is God trying to get us to understand? He's trying to get us to understand the importance of love and that we cannot forget to love others. We cannot forget to love people around us. It says we can have all of those things. We can accomplish as much as, as you'd look at somebody that has all this stuff and say, wow, that's a really spiritual person that's, uh, that's doing doing really well, but God says if we don't have love, we are nothing. And so I think he's trying to, to encourage us that love needs to be a big deal. And so today, that's what I want to focus on. How do we live out love? How do we live it out? Because it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, that's fine, but what does it look like in our everyday lives? How does it, how does it look as, as, as we love people? What, uh, what is that supposed to look like? So to start with, I thought we would look at what love does not look like. Sometimes it's easier to define uh, that, right? And sometimes uh, it helps for us to learn from other people's mistakes. And, and uh, it's great to look at other people that have done something maybe not so well and then uh, adjust our course. I always say it's great to not be the first person in line, right? Unless it's like a communion cup that everybody's sharing or something. Then <laughs> I want to be the first person in line. <laughs> but other than that, like, I, it's nice to just sit back and chill for a second and just like watch how other people are doing it and be like, oh, okay, yep. Now I, I get it. Now I can do this. And, uh, and so I think we can do that when it comes to this too. So if you look, there's a story in Scripture that I want us to turn to. And uh, it's in Mark, uh, chap uh, uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. And this is a, a story in Scripture where Jesus got ticked off. And uh, it just seems wrong, you know, like Jesus isn't supposed to be ticked, right? Like Jesus is just supposed to always be, you know, the guy with the flowing hair and his sandals, just with this smile and this peaceful look on his face, you know, maybe holding a child on one leg and a lamb or something on the other, you know, that's, that's the mental picture we have. And so when you think of Jesus being ticked, it's like, no, this, there's, there's something off here. And, uh, and this story always, always made me a little bit uncomfortable uh, because I just thought, Jesus, is you can't get mad you're you're Jesus you know like like you just can't you can't do this and and I I, I feel a little bit awkward even when I read this story because have you ever watched a fight go down and you're just like a spectator you know maybe it happened in the car on the way to church today I don't I don't know but like like there's just a fight that goes down and you're just kind of like awkward in the middle like uh, hey I'm here you know maybe it's you know every holiday with your family something something just goes down and um that's how I feel about, uh, about this story. I kind of feel a little bit awkward. Like, man, I don't, I don't know if Jesus should, uh, should, be, should be getting mad right now at this. And so if you look at this story, um, I never understood 
um, why Jesus was angry. And so once you, once you figure out why Jesus was angry, it kind of all makes sense. So Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 18, it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for ways to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed by his teaching. See, Jesus here, he was really mad. I mean, he made a scene. He, he freaked out. He's over there just, just flipping tables. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't even just a, like, okay, guys, I'm really frustrated right now with you. No, I mean, he's like, he's throwing a tantrum. You right? Like, he's flipping tables and kicking people out. Like, this isn't, like, like this is one of those moments, like, if you ever get angry and you just do something, you're like, oh, that was dumb, you know? Like, like this is the moment that it seems like Jesus is happening, but, but uh, he, he's upset, and he makes a scene, and you can tell uh, that it was bugging him. And if you read a little bit earlier in that scripture, it was kind of leading up to this moment because he, earlier he was hungry so maybe he's just hangry that's a real thing the struggle's real and uh and and he was he was hungry and so he walks over to a fig tree to get some fruit to get a fig off of this tree and there was nothing there and so he basically makes this fig tree wilt wither because uh because there was no fruit and then he turns it into a lesson about not loving and, and basically uh being a fruitless tree that's not showing the love of god so i mean He's angry up to this point already. He's just walking by trees and making them wilt, right? So then he gets to the temple and he's like, Wah! you know, Hulk. He just went Hulk on the, on, on, on the tables. And so you look at it and go, why was he so angry? Why was he, why was he upset? And some people think, well, he was upset because you're not supposed to be selling stuff in church. Bake sales are not of the Lord, you know, like, like. No, that's actually not, not what it is. It's not because he was selling things, uh, because bake sales are anointed and inspired by God, and we should have as many of them as possible. No, but it wasn't because they were selling stuff. It was the way that they were selling stuff. See, the problem here, and the reason he was so angry, is that these people were making it difficult for people to come to God. See, they were making it hard. They were making it difficult for people to come to God. They were profiting instead of helping people get right with God. They were profiting instead of showing the love of God. And this is where I want us to just just do a refocus even as a church. We talk about it all the time, about caring about people, but we have to be careful. We have to constantly check ourselves because if, if we're not careful, church can be something that becomes all about us. It can, be, can become something that becomes all about us and all we care about is what we can profit from it, what we can get from it. I came and the worship was good, so I felt really good. That's great. I, I heard a message and, and, and I kind of you know, was able to chew on it all week and that's, that's cool. That's, that's awesome. And it should be that, but that's not where it stops because if we're not careful, it can just become about us profiting and us getting closer to God and we forget the heart of God and that's to reach out to other people. See, at this time, the temple was supposed to be where people came to get right with God. And oftentimes they would have to make, uh, they would have to come from a distance and they would have to make sacrifices to atone for their sins. This is before Jesus died on the cross and paid that price uh, for us. And so they used to have to make animal sacrifices to atone or to make payment for the sins in their life. And so that they would have to go and if they travel or whatever, they wouldn't bring the animal with them. So they would need to buy a dove or an animal to make a sacrifice. And as they traveled then, a lot of them would change currencies, and so they would need to, to, to change their money over in order to make those purchases. And so this is what's going on. This is why Jesus was so angry. It's because they were ripping people off as they were trying to get right with God. They were focused on themselves and not on helping people come uh, closer to God. They were giving bad exchange rates, and they were overcharging for the doves. And the crazy part, though, here is you couldn't get right with God without these things. I'm glad we don't live under that system anymore. But you couldn't get right without these things. And so really they were taking advantage of these people because they wanted to get right with God. And instead of helping them, instead of, instead of loving them and caring for them, they were taking advantage of them and they were profiting. They couldn't get right without them. The only thing I was thinking, like, what, what does this relate to like in our culture? And obviously our salvation is not on the line. But you go to a movie theater 
right? And it's the same kind of concept. You go to a movie theater and you get through those gates and somehow popcorn becomes worth $6, right? <laughs> Like, I could go buy, you know, I could go buy a ton of popcorn at, uh, at Coburn's or at Walmart, you know. I could get, I could get a bulk bag. And, uh, but no, you walk in there and all of a sudden popcorn becomes gold. And, uh, and you're like $10 or $12 into a drink and, and some popcorn. Why? Because they got you, right? They, you, you can't bring food in. But I know some of you, <laughs> you're sneakers. You're like... <laughs> You're like, hey, go to a movie, you know, I better stuff my, you know, my purse, you know, or, or, you know, now they're checking bags, I heard, my kids told me, so like, you know, stucking it in their hoodies and, you know, like, like all over wearing bulky clothes, walking into, shaking, you know, as the candy's going, so um, I have to tell you this, this is horrible. <laughs> it's like, I'm so not proud of it, but I'm so proud of it. Um, one of my daughters, I won't tell which one, but her name's Lydia, and she, um, she, um, she snuck in some food. This is the best item I've ever heard, snuck into a movie theater. She snuck in a rotisserie chicken. All right? I mean, I'm not talking like a little bag of, of something, you know? Like, she snuck in a rotisserie chicken, like, from Coburn's, and... And it's like sitting there eating the chicken, you know? And so I, I was like, and then when I heard about it, I was like, yeah, that's pretty awesome, you know? But then I was like, no, I have to be a dad, you know, here in, in, in a parenting moment, you know? It's like, okay, uh, you know, why, why'd you sneak in this chicken? You know, they, you're not supposed to bring in food because they want you to buy their food. And she's like, if they were selling chicken, I would have bought it. <laughs> and, I was, and I was like, that's, that's logical. That makes sense to me. I, parenting moment is over you win you know <laughs> round is over but uh, that has nothing to do with the message really but <laughs> but really what was happening is these people had to come and they were trying to make sacrifice and they were this, these items that they needed to get right with God they were overcharging them they were making it difficult to come to God they were really kind of holding they were kind of holding their salvation hostage unless they would pay these prices for these things and so this is what Jesus uh, was upset about he was upset because it was hard for them to come to God it was hard for them to get right with God and these people were making it that way that's that's what it was the selfishness it was the profiting it was the taking advantage of people that were trying to get right with God that's what Jesus was so upset about Jesus constantly and consistently spoke against religious people in Scripture. If you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you, as you read through them, you see that Jesus was, was always just harping on the Pharisees. He was harping on the Sadducees. He was harping on religious leaders um, that, that weren't about loving people. He kind of set things upside down. Before, it was like, uh, be, like the religious leaders were, were, were pretty pompous, and they were like pretty, you know, like, hey, you can someday achieve to get to our level. And Jesus comes in with a totally different mentality, and he shows how to love, and he shows how to serve, and he shows how to reach out to people. And Jesus consistently was against those religious people that made it difficult to come from God, leaders that would set up hoops for people to jump through. And leaders that were focusing on the rules and religion rather than on loving people. But scripture teaches us that you can do all of the religious things. You can follow every single rule. You can have all of the gifts of the spirit. You can give all of your money away. But without love, we've missed it. That's what this series has been about. Without love, it's just the sound of a gong. It doesn't mean anything. The words are worthless. So what does it look like? Let's look at a different example in scripture, kind of a contrast to the religious leaders. This is how Jesus handled people. This is the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, uh, it's a popular story, but in Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10, Jesus enters Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, uh, because he was uh, but, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Jesus, uh, since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. See, here's where the difference happens. Verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. See, it was so against their culture because their, their culture had trained them to just to, to avoid them and to shame them. But Jesus 
Calls him out of the tree and goes, hey, man, I need to come over and eat. I love that. I might try that today for lunch. Like, hey, I need to come to your house right now and eat. Um, but the, the people saw this and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, uh, said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. See, in this story, you see the heart of Christ. It was to seek and save the lost. That's why Jesus came. That's what we're supposed to be about. He's to seek and save the lost. See, he sought out Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a, was a tax collector, and it wasn't a respected position then because those tax collectors would just kind of make their own rules, and they would take more money than they were supposed to, and they cheated stuff. And that's why when he said, I'm going to give my stuff to the poor and anything, anyone I've cheated, I'm giving back to. And uh, he made things right in his life when he had that encounter with Jesus because Jesus is about seeking and saving the lost. See, that's what love is. It's about caring for others. It's about making a way for people to come to Jesus. It's about reaching out. It's about noticing people. It's about being a kingdom builder. It's about being about building God's kingdom, about people coming to know him. See, Jesus was the first kingdom builder. He's a perfect example, and he teaches us how to reach people. He teaches us how to care. He teaches us how to love. He teaches us how to reach out. And then uh, this verse that, that, that's in 1 Corinthians, it tells us exactly what love is and the difference and what it should look like in our lives. And this list, I don't know about you, but, but in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, this verse gets read at, at weddings a ton, but this, man, I'm going to be working on this verse the rest of my life. Because this is who Jesus is, and we're supposed to become like this. First Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient. That's not me, so I failed at the very first one. You know what I mean? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. This is what love is. This is how we're supposed to treat people. This is, how, this is what's supposed to fill our lives as we get closer and closer to God. This is who we're supposed to be. But these people weren't acting like this. They were, they were murmuring against Jesus as he was going to spend time with that sinner. Let that never become our heart. We have to keep our eyes focused outside of these walls on people that need Jesus. That's supposed to be our heart. Our heart. See, instead, God didn't judge him. Instead, Jesus, when he reached out to, to, to Zacchaeus, he loved him, cared about him, wanted to spend time with him. And because of that, as he showed him love, forgiveness followed, and life change happened in his life. First John 4, 7 through 9 says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. See, this is how we're supposed to live as Christians, as people that are following God, as people that are, that are, that are trying to become like him. As we get to know God, as we get to know who, who God is and God is love, then love starts to permeate our lives. It starts to overflow. It starts to bubble out of us because as we become more like him, as we, as, as we focus on his truth and his scripture and as we try to apply that stuff to our lives, we begin to change and out of us starts coming love. Out of us starts to come the things that God, that God wants us to do and the things that he wants in our lives. It's an overflow of God in us. And suddenly we find ourselves becoming less judgmental. We find ourselves being less, less selfish, less impatient, less rude, less hot-headed, less proud. We become more forgiving. We become more caring, more hopeful, more trusting, more faithful. See, as we seek after God, as we, as we follow him, these things start to come out of our lives. And it's something that we're supposed to live out. So what does that look like? Really practical. How do, how do we live that out? I mean, let's be real, right? When it says that Jesus is love, then when Jesus was walking around, he was just being himself, right? 
Like, if Jesus is love and he's loving people, he's just being himself. Well, I'm not naturally that way, right? We're not naturally, uh, we're not naturally Jesus. We're not, we don't naturally think that way necessarily. And so what does that look like for us? I'm not naturally uh, patient, first thing on the list. I'm just, I'm not a patient person. Like, I, uh, I try and I try to be polite, but I'm just like, I like to have a plan. I like to move, let's move, let's move, let's move. That's just, that's just my personality, and I'm sorry for all of you that I've hurt. <laughs> but that's my, that's my personality, and so it's like, love is patient. I mean, honestly, I'm the worst driver on the planet, and I know that. Like, my wife reminds me every time she rides with me, you know? And, and uh, because I just, I'm not patient. So it's like, if, if I can go without getting hit, I'm going to go. That's like... <laughs> That's my filter. And so it's really tricky when I'm trying to teach my kids to drive. Just like, no, you probably shouldn't go. I mean, I would, but you shouldn't, you know? <laughs> like, that, that doesn't work. I mean, I, I sort of take merging as a challenge to get in front of the other cars, you know? So, so I'm not patient, and I know that, and I, need to, and I need to work on that stuff. So what does it look like as we live out love? Because love is patient. So I need to work on that, and, and God will help us. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But, but uh, as, as, as we... As we work against what's natural for us, which I'm not naturally, I'm, I'm naturally selfish. We're naturally selfish. We naturally want to take care of ourselves. We naturally are, are impatient. We're naturally a, a, a opposite kind of of what that list says. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't step out. I still need to step out and I need to work on those things. And we don't always get it right. When I was, when I was, when I was thinking and praying about this message and preparing, I thought of this story. And it was funny because my wife was in uh, service and she had never heard this before because it was when I was a kid. And for whatever reason, the story popped into my mind. And I, it was when I was, a, uh, I was in elementary school. I was in second or third grade at uh, Sand Creek Elementary School in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. And uh, we, used to, um, we used to walk to school <laughs> that was a thing back then. Um, just kidding. <laughs> now it's like if you're more than a block from school, like, oh, will you drive me? It's like, oh, okay. But I used to walk to school like uh, about a mile every day. And, 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 uh, and so I was on my way home one day and, um, and I saw this kid um, picking on this other kid, right? Bullying. And uh, he was pushing him around. And, uh, and, and you could tell the kid was, was, was already crying. And, uh, and something, something just welled up in me like, I need to do something. You ever see something that's not right? You see it in, uh, something that, sh- that, that shouldn't be the way it is, and, and you just get that, that urge, like, like something, and that's God in you speaking to you and saying, right, let's do this, let's fix this, let's make this right. Well, as a second grader, I didn't know what to do, right? So, um, and I wasn't real eloquent with words. I'm still not, but uh, like, like I, I wasn't going to be like go over and have a conversation and talk this bully down, right? I had a huge stuttering uh, uh, problem and I was a huge introvert. So, I mean, that would have just been a train wreck. I would have gone over and be like, hey, 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 you know, you need to stop, stop. That wouldn't have worked. So as I'm seeing him, I'm like, all right, I'm going to play, I'm going to play into my strengths. You know what my strength was? My size. I've always been a little what my mom calls husky. (laughs) I think it's a nice word for fat, but I'm not sure yet. So I was like, I, I don't know what to do, but I got to stop this. And so, uh, so what I did, I don't think it was necessarily right, but I, I uh, started running towards these two kids that were fight, that 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 uh, the one was getting picked on. And so I ran at him. It was more like a waddle, but I was I was I just went towards them and I got to him and I pushed the bully off of the other kid. Right. And uh, I would have loved for it to be just like this heroic moment where just there was other kids in the background cheering like, you saved him, you know. And then I put my arm around him and like, I always got your back, you know. But it wasn't a movie moment. Actually, what happened then is the kid that I pushed went flying off and hit the ground. And so he started crying and he ran off. And then the kid that was getting bullied, he was already crying. So he ran off. And then I was like, I just might have hurt this kid. So I started crying because I thought I was going to get in trouble. So there there were three of us boys just running in opposite directions all crying you know it's like what happened you know was that the love of God I don't think so but just because we don't get it right all the time doesn't mean we shouldn't work at it doesn't mean we shouldn't do something and I just encourage you just to to step out because the truth is is God's love when it starts to pour out of us it starts it helps us to see people around us it helps us see people around us See, once we, as, as we're going after God and as, as, as we love him, as we sing these songs, as we, as we apply his scripture to our lives, 
The longer we get to know him, we should start to see those around us. It isn't about a club. It isn't about us coming to church and feeling good about ourselves. It's about us caring about people and seeing those that are around us. We find ourselves caring for people in need. We see a world that needs Jesus. So how do we, how do we live that out? Well, the cool part is it is the role of the Holy Spirit. Here's where it ties into this series. It's the role of the Holy Spirit to help us. It's the role of the Holy Spirit to help us. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is the verse that Seth has said in, this, in, the, in the video. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit will help us. That's what this says. That's good news because it's his role. He will help us go. He helps us reach people. He helps us be a witness. He helps us love, which is great news because I can't do it on my own. You know, if if I do it on my own, I'm just like a bowling ball running into bullies. I mean, that just doesn't, it doesn't work. But Jesus can help us. Jesus wants to come alongside us. We don't have to do it our own. He wants to help us reach people. And he will, we will receive power so that we can go. See, the Holy Spirit gives us power to keep our eyes outside of these walls. See, naturally, I think if we're just left to our own, we just become like the Pharisees. We become like those people that Jesus despised in Scripture and was teaching against and was trying to change culture for when he came. Naturally, we have a tendency to just kind of hoard God to ourselves, hoard that hope to ourselves and say, look what God did for me. And we love God and our relationship with him, but it can become all about us. We can get to a place where we don't see others. We don't care about others. We don't want people to come and mess up kind of our experience at church or or what's normal for us. Or heaven forbid someone would take your favorite seat that you sit in every week, right? We just sometimes don't want things to change, but God's desire is different. Jesus was asked to narrow down the the most important things in life. He said, what's the most important thing in life? It was actually a trick question. And he uh, said, what's the, all of, out of all of the law, what's the most important? What are the things that, that we have to make sure that we do? And they were trying to trick him, and Jesus answers, but he doesn't just give them one. He gives them two, and we call it the great commandment. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your minds. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. That's what Jesus' answer is. Love God, love people. We feel like when we do that, then we'll love life. Love God, love people. See, you, you, you can't do one without the other. Jesus was asked for the most important thing, and he wouldn't do it. He said, no, you need to love God, but you can't just do that. If you love God, you'll love people. Love God and love people. It has to be something that that we become about. And the Holy Spirit will help us do this. It'll help us look outside of these walls. That's what Kingdom Builders is all about. That's 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 what really being a Kingdom Builder is. It's why you hear us constantly talk about missions and Kingdom Builders. It's because it's the heart of God. And honestly, as a church, it's the way we intentionally keep our heart focused on God's heart. It's how we make sure that it doesn't just become about us. It's it's the way we make sure. We want to make sure that that, that we're reaching outside of these walls, that it's not just about this club or what happens in this church, but it's about what God is doing in this community, in this city, in this state, in this nation, in the world. What is God doing and how can we be a part of it? How do we keep our eyes looking outside? And so that's why we intentionally uh, focus on those things because it's God's heart for us. And I know you might feel like maybe you can't make a difference. Maybe you feel like you can't, you can't pray. Maybe you feel like you can't give. Maybe you feel like you can't go on trips. But the cool part is the Holy Spirit will help us. He enables us to step out in faith. Acts 1.8, one more time, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. He will help you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, this verse is what we've based Kingdom Builder strategy on. It's here, there, and everywhere. Here is local. Sartell, St. Cloud, Sock Rapids, Wake Park, right around in our area. And then there's there, which is our nation. 
All over this country, people need Jesus. And then everywhere, globally, literally around the world. And so we have committed to pray. We have committed to do several things in these areas. We want to pray for our missionaries. We want to give to our missionaries. And we want to, and we want to go and become missionaries. We want to go and as Jesus helps us, as God helps us, as he empowers us, as the Holy Spirit is there for us, helping us in these areas, we want to do those things. So as we support our missionaries and our organizations in each of these areas, we do it consistently. We pray, and uh, we pray faithfully. If you've been around here, you'll notice every single service we have, we pray for one of our missionaries. Why? Because we want to make sure that we lift them up to the Lord, number one, and two, because it helps us keep our hearts where they're supposed to be. Loving God and loving people. We pray for our missionaries. And I would encourage you to pray. If you want a list of our missionaries, you can get a list of our missionaries on our website under resources, waterschurch.net. You click on the resources tab, and then you'll see a big old banner that says Kingdom Builders, just like, the, uh, just like our, our logo for Kingdom Builders. And you can click on there, and there's a list of all of our missionaries um, that we can publish. We actually have some secret missionaries, which is pretty cool. So covert because they'd get in trouble if we uh, uh, if the countries that they're in knew that they were there. So those aren't listed there, um, but uh, every other missionary is. And so I'd encourage you to pray. Uh, pray for our missionaries. It's one way that we can keep our eyes focused on others is by praying for our missionaries. And another thing we do is we give. We give financially to kingdom builders. And many of you guys have made faith promises. And, uh, and we give to kingdom builders and missions, and we make it a priority. Our goal this year is $400,000 in 2019 to give outside of these walls, which I think is awesome. Because if we do that, it's, it's a positioning of our heart that says, God, it isn't just about what happens here. It just isn't about the services and the things that we do. It's just not about eating 2,000 pounds of meat, which is pretty stinking cool. Um, but it's about reaching out as well. And even in the meeting, it's an outreach because we want to reach out to people. But the truth is, is that God wants to work through us. And part of the way he can do that is through our finances. And so uh, many of us have made faith promises to faithfully support kingdom builders. Uh, and it's gifts that go above and beyond our tithe to the Lord. And so many people are, are already giving monthly or they're giving annually or they're set up on auto uh, pay, which is awesome. So I would encourage you to consider giving to kingdom builders. Uh, if you, if you uh, don't know what, what we're giving towards this year, we kind of make a big deal. Out, we made a big deal out of it a couple times already this year. But um, uh, in the back, there's these, these books that kind of lay out the projects, the goal of the 400000 You can go pick one of those up in the back on your way out if you want. That's not the focus of this morning, but, um, but many of us have made those faith promises. And so uh, we don't receive special offerings anymore for the giving. We just have it on every single area that, that you could give. So on the envelopes, there's a spot that says Kingdom Builders. If you go on the app, there's a spot that says Kingdom Builders. If you go online, there's a spot that says Kingdom Builders. And you can give towards that because what it does is it, again, it helps us keep our eyes focused outside these walls. It helps us focus on other people. So the worship team is going to uh, get ready to come as we kind of close down this morning. But the other thing we do is we go. We go, and the Holy Spirit helps us go. But we go here, there, and everywhere. And uh, we started doing trips, Kingdom Builder trips, missions trips. Uh, we started doing them uh, about six years ago. And uh, uh, I remember being able to lead the, the first team out of here um, from uh, to El Salvador. And we took a, a group of over 20 people to El Salvador as our first trip. And now it's cool to see how it's grown and how we're doing multiple trips from multiple different ages and multiple locations every single year. And so I just want to let you know that God can use you and will help you if you want to go on a trip. And so we have opportunities right now. We have a kid's trip that's happening this summer. Uh, the registration is opening for. It's to Treetop Farms. It's the missionary that our kids are praying for and giving towards uh, on a weekly basis in our kids' church, which is awesome. And so it's a farm on the north side of the cities that helps underprivileged kids, and, uh, and they help the uh, at-risk kids kind of um, um, straighten out, and they use the farm to do that, and they teach them the gospel, which is just awesome. And so, uh, so we have a group of kids going out to, uh, to do that, so you can sign up for that. My daughter, Avery, she's... Um, just finished first grade, and she is so pumped to go on this trip. She, she's like uh, signed up already, and she goes, I'm actually going to Treetop Kids because they pray for those missionaries every single week, and so it's cool. So I'd encourage you to sign up your kids. Go with them. 
New Mexico. It's uh, a trip that's near uh, reservation. There's openings for this. There's still spots uh, uh, available, and uh, it's near reservation. It's a camp, and we go in and put on this camp for these kids, and, uh, and it's just amazing to see what happens. And so there's still some spots. Pastor, Pastor Becky is leading that trip. And then Israel. Uh, just, I mean, I know a quick commercial right here at the end, but Israel is coming up and uh, Pastor Doug and Peggy are leading this trip and registration's open for that. The trip is uh, October 7th through the 16th and uh, there's actually an info meeting on June 12th, Wednesday night, June 12th. And so this trip's going to be, the Israel trip's going to be a little bit more uh, like vision and visiting the sites and uh, as a little bit less of the roll up your sleeves um, and, and work kind of a trip. But uh, it's going to uh, really, it's going to be impacting because of what seeing those sites where Jesus walked and where he taught and all of those biblical sites as you visit those to see the impact that that will have in your heart. And, and then those around you as you come back and share that will be a powerful trip. And so if you're interested in going to Israel, going to the Holy Land, uh, there's an info meeting on June 12th, Wednesday night, and then the deadline to sign up for that will be uh, uh, June 28th. So if you want more information, you can always write it on your on a, on a card and drop it uh, uh, in the offering any one of these weeks, or just come talk to me or send us an email. But uh, really excited about that trip. I know Doug and Peggy are hoping to, uh, to get about 20 people to go with them. So and I don't know if you've ever done anything with Doug and Peggy. But it's a party, all right? So it will be fun. And, uh, and so if you're interested in that, I would love for you to, to do that. But there's other trips that are in motion as well. The youth are leaving for Panama on Tuesday. And so uh, you can't go on that trip. It's too late. But uh, they're leaving on Tuesday, which is cool. And uh, they're going down to, to work there. Uh, Doug is going to work with Pastor Abel in India, one of the churches that we helped start in India, which is amazing. And he's going to go work with them. There's a return trip to Kenya with Zoe in, uh, in September. And so that's in motion already. We've got future trips on the book. We're already talking for 2020. Uh, Alaska got postponed till 2020. Pastor Sefa wants to lead a team to Ghana. And so uh, that'll be cool if you don't value your life. You could go on that trip. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We shouldn't pick on stuff like we do. But I do, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. That I challenge every single person. I believe that every person should go on at least one missions trip. Every person should go on at least one mission trip. And the reason why is because they change your life. They change your view of the world. And they change our hearts to be more like God. So what it does is so we're used to maybe maybe you travel a little bit and you get to go to on vacation or you go on a destination or you go somewhere and the purpose is for you and that's okay that's that's healthy that's normal but the purpose is for you or if you're a dad let's face it it's for your kids right um, but it's it's for your family but when you go on a mission trip you're going somewhere and you're kind of setting your life aside you're setting aside the comfort you're setting aside what's normal and your box you're setting that aside and you're going solely for the purpose of caring for people, for loving people. And when you do that, when you set yourself aside, when you take a step out of, of faith like that, when you, when you put aside kind of the, the just, just going through life and you put yourself aside and you do a selfless act like go on a missions trip, God does something incredible in your heart. God does something incredible. He changes how you see people and you're so close to his heart that it makes a, a difference. Most people you talk to will say that the missions trip was one of the best moments of their life because they got to see something in a different light. And so I would encourage you to go on a missions trip. We're gonna to continue to offer them. If the ones that we have on the schedule don't work, we're gonna to continue to offer multiple trips every single year. Why? Because it keeps us focused on God's heart. It keeps us looking out there, which is what God wants for us. Would you stand with me this morning? <laughs> We're gonna go into the song here in a moment, but the truth is, and what I want you to catch today is that the world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus, and he wants you. He wants to use you to reach them. He wants to use you, the life that you live. He wants it to be focused on others. And the cool part is he's gonna help us. Here's an awesome promise that we can hold on to in Matthew 28, 19. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's God's promise that he will be with us, that we can go do this task, that we can love people, that we can reach outside these walls, and that God will be with us every step of the way. The world needs Jesus, and he wants you 
to reach people. If we're going to go into the song. I just want you to use this song as a time of just reflection. And just as, as we sing about how, how the world needs Jesus, where is your heart at? I want to come back out and pray for a few things. But just I would encourage you, where is your heart at? Is your heart focused outside, outside of your own life? I say these walls when we're together as a church, but really is your, is your heart focused outside your own life, in your circle, your home, your bubble? I just encourage you to use this time because the world needs Jesus and his plan to reach them is you. Let's sing this together. you just put your hand up real quick and you can put it right back down yeah thanks all right second thing
thing I want to pray for is maybe you're in this place and, and God's kind of speaking to your heart that you're supposed to, that you're, you're getting moved to, to go, that you're supposed to do something. You feel that welling up in your, in your heart that you're supposed to go, that you're supposed to pray, that you're supposed to give. But maybe you don't feel like you can. Maybe you always thought it was for somebody else. Maybe you thought that, that it was something that, that, that super Christians were supposed to do and that wasn't, that wasn't something you're supposed to do, but God's stirring your heart to do that. And you would just say, I need God's help to do this. There's hope for me. If God will help me, I'll do this because God's stirring my heart. So if that's you and you just say, I need the Holy Spirit's help to step out like this. If that's you, would you put your hand up? I want to pray for you today. Yeah, there's hands up everywhere. I pray before we go. I also want to pray, maybe you're here, there's just, maybe you're hearing this and you're hearing the, the heart of God and as we, as you hear that again, you, you feel like maybe you're a little bit out of focus. This isn't a judgment thing at all because I think at all, all the time we have to continue to refocus ourselves on God's heart, but maybe you felt like you need to refocus on loving people. Maybe your vision has become a little bit too inward focused and you, you need God's help to not be like the religious rulers, but to have the heart of Jesus, to see people and to reach out for people, to seek them out so that God can save them. I don't know if that's you this morning, but if you just say, I just need God's help to kind of refocus me a little bit on his heart, to realign me with who God is. If that's you, would you put your hand up? I wanna pray for you today too. Yeah. Cool. And the last thing I wanna pray for is we just have trips that are leaving the summer. Panama leaving in a couple days. I just wanna lift them up for the Lord before we leave too, that God would help them be productive. So let's pray together before we leave. God, we thank you so much. God, for who you are and your great love for us. God, and I pray, God, for those people, God, that put their hands up that said they want to start a relationship with you. God, I pray that you would do that. God, come into their lives. God, we thank you for, for make, paying that price for our sins. God, I pray you would make them right with you and start down that journey and that path with you. God, and I pray, God, that they would come to know you, God, and that they would experience that great life, God, of the hope, God, that we have as they put their faith and their trust in you. God, I pray you would come into their hearts this morning, God, and they would start that journey. God, and then I pray for people, God, that, that are feeling moved by you. God, they're feeling, they're feeling stirred by you, God, to, to go on trips, God, or to pray uh, for missionaries, God, or to give towards kingdom builders. God, I pray, God, that, 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 that you would help them. God, you promised us, God, that your Holy Spirit, God, would help us. God, that you would help us be your witness. God, so as, as we witness, God, as we do this thing, God, I pray that you, God, would help us. God, even if they don't feel worthy, God, even if we don't feel like we can do it, God, on our own, God, then we're right in the place where you want us, God, and you can step in and make a difference. So I pray that you would do that. God, help, God, our finances. God, help our time. God, help, uh, God, just our sight, God, as we see people. God, I pray that you would help us to reach others. God, and then we pray, God, for, for people, God, that are just here. And as we, as we hear from your word, we're challenged again, God, to refocus our heart, to refocus on our, our heart on you, to refocus, God, and not just on ourselves, not in our lives, not on our bubble, God, but the world that's around us that you love so much, God. And I pray, God, that we would realize that we're holding hope in our hands, God, that we're holding hope, God, and that we can give it out, God, as you work through us. So I pray, God, that you would help us refocus on you, help us see people, help us reach people. God, and then I pray for our, our, our teams that are already in motion, God, that are going. God, we pray for Panama, God, as they leave Tuesday. God, God, we pray that you would just bless them. God, keep them safe. God, pray for Garrett and Tara, Kenyon, God, the missionaries they're working with. I pray that that uh, people would come to know you because of these students that have, that, that have worked so hard to raise money and that are sacrificing to go. God, and I pray that as they take this time, God, and they focus on your heart, I pray that you would pour into them in such an incredible way, God, that you would change their lives and they would never be the same. God, work on those trips. God, we pray for the trip to Treetop Farms. God, we pray for Pastor Doug as he goes to India, God, and Nat. God, we pray, God, that you would just work through them. God, we pray, God, make a huge impact. God, we pray for the trip that's going to New Mexico. God, be with them this summer as well. We just pray for your hand of covering over all of these trips, God. And I pray for anyone that's thinking or being stirred that they, they might go on a trip. God, I pray that you would, you would uh, God, push them over the edge a little bit, God, and that they would take that step of faith. God, so as we leave this place now this morning, God, I pray that you would go with us. God, may, may we be your, your hands and feet. God, may we be a light in the city. God, may we be a city on a hill, God, that stands out 
God, because of the love that's pouring out from within us. God, so I pray that we would love people, that we would be selfless people walking out of this place, God, and that we would model you and represent you well to others. God, continue to work in our hearts and our lives. God, and may we spread the hope that you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want prayer, there's prayer teams up front on both sides. There's also a communion if you want to take communion before you leave. But God bless. Have a great weekend.